Bill Davis was the Premier of Ontario, Margaret Thatcher led Britain, and Ronald Reagan was sitting in the U.S. White House when then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau appointed Anne Cools to the Canadian Senate, making her the first black woman senator in North American history. 34 years later, she's caucused with the Liberals, the Conservatives, and today sits as an Independent. She retires this summer, and we're pleased to welcome her back to our studio for a look at nearly three and a half decades in the Red Chamber. Welcome, Senator Ann Cools. Good to have you back here. It's wonderful to be with you. We should say you're retiring because you're turning 75, yes, and that's yes. the mandatory retirement age. That is the mandatory age. Well, I want to take you back to the very beginning, because you grew up in Barbados, yes. and I want to know who your sort of political heroes were at that time that might have got you interested in politics. Well, they were more than political heroes. They were my relatives. So I grew up in Barbados. I left when I was 13 years old, and uh, I come from a family that was very actively involved in the politics of Barbados. Like who? Like, for example, my uncle, his name was Freddie Miller, Frederick Edward Miller. And he actually uh, was a, was a, they call them MCPs, members of colonial parliament. And he was actually the first minister of health ever uh, in Barbados when they finally got to a stage where governance reached a stage where they would have cabinet government. And then I had another one, his brother, and they're both my mother's brothers, okay. named Thomas Washington Miller, lovely names. And uh, he uh, was in politics as well. Do you have any doubt but that they sort of planted a seed in your head about going into politics someday? I have a suspicion that is what happened, yeah. but I do not think I was that much, co uh, that much cognizant of it. But then we have another, the next generation. So uh, my Uncle Freddie's daughter, who's my first cousin, Billy, she uh, followed his footsteps and uh, went into politics. and retired some years ago, and when she then retired a few years ago, she'd been foreign minister, minister of foreign affairs for quite some time. Huh, in Barbados. So, in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, because I count to this, and then we had another cousin, another sibling's son, who was also an MP an M, uh, for a period of time, and then another one in another generation. <laughs> so we've had a couple of generations. This is the family business, in a way. It, it, it would appear. And the interesting thing is, is that my, I learned uh, some years back that my grandfather had been a member, member of the vestry, which was the, the, uh, the sort of public service, a little bit of governance out of the churches. Huh. So he was a vestryman. So it runs in the family, I Indeed think. Indeed it does. But I want to stop now because uh, I have no children. Right, and you're about to retire, and so... I'm, and I'm coming, up to, I'm coming up to the... We want to take a good long look at your life. the starting gate to the ending gate. <laughs> well, the, the end of this, but probably the, the beginning of something else, True. if I could know be, you. You came to Canada, as you point out, when you were 13. You went to Montreal originally, and um, you, you really, if I can put it this way, you became quite famous almost 50 years ago when you were part of a sit-in, a student occupation, at a computer center at uh, what was then called Sir George Williams. Mm -hmm. Uh, university, now Today, Concordia, Concordia, indeed. Uh, there were allegations of racism at the time. You guys wanted to, you students, wanted to make your points known. You did a sit-in. Someone set fire to the building. Chaos ensued. The computer center got trashed. And you ended up four months in jail. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, with the benefit of a half a century nearly of hindsight, what was the big lesson in all of that for you? The big lesson for me was that I was naive. Naive about what, though? Well, for example, I thought there was a principle involved for me. If I has, was prepared to plead guilty, everything would have been over. But you wouldn't. Right, because I thought it was the principal thing to do. And uh, now I look back, and that is a youthful look, a youthful e expression. Are you saying that if principle. you had to do it again, that you maybe should have pleaded guilty and avoided the jail time? Yeah, it was four months. Yeah. Yes, um, probably. <laughs> but I'm just saying to you, I'm not saying what I would do because <laughs> it would never be those circumstances again. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying to you is that those events disrupted my life and everybody's life, every single person's uh, life. And it took me a lot of years to understand because we were all too young to, to accept that these powerful older people who were professors and heads of departments were unwilling to deal with a, a pretty straightforward situation. Mm -hmm. 
And that took me a long time to grasp and to understand. This is just human nature. Mm. In the mid-1970s, having worked as a social worker, you founded one of Canada's first women's shelters. And I wonder, before that shelter was in place, if a woman was the victim of domestic violence before, what did she do at that time? Well, they, they call those things, the police call them domestics. But this is some work that I feel very good about. But, and you could say I was a front runner um, in the field. And uh, for whatever reason, some of this began with a woman in England I, that I call my soul sister, whose name is Erin Pizzi. And she's the person in Europe, in England really, who started the whole, the whole movement towards dealing with uh, domestic violence as a public policy question. What did women do, though, before you did that work? I guess they just went to their neighbors, friendly neighbors, or whatever they could do. So this was a significant step forward then? A huge step forward. And uh, my, my agency was especially very, very, very successful. Mm. And we always, we always did very well. You caught the people. eye of the Liberal Party of Canada uh, a little bit after this. You ran for the nomination in 1978 to be the Liberal candidate in Rosedale. That was a big one. Great documentary made about that, eh? Oh, yeah, The Right Candidate, something like the that. I think it was called it the, the, film board. The, the Right Choice for Rosedale? Yeah, was The that Right it? Candidate, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that was a great documentary. Yeah, and that was a film board, national film yes. board again. Anyway, you, lo you lost that nomination to John Evans, yes. who ended up losing the by-election to David Crombie, the former yes. mayor. Yes, You then won two nominations in a row and ran in the 79 and 80 elections and lost those two. So yes. it was three losses in a row. How yes. much did that hurt at the time? A little. Not that much, really? Well, not, not so much as, as to discourage one. Hmm. But you have to remember, I always had a, a supporter in Pierre Elliott Trudeau. We have a shot of the two of you together, actually. Oh, well, there's, let's some bring this up. there's some beautiful. Let's, let's bring this picture up right now. Okay, there's e some beautiful Even photographs. though you sustained those three losses in a row, there is the current prime minister's father who called you one day and said, what? I want to bring you to the Senate. And what did you answer when he I, said that? I just about died. <laughs> but I had heard from another uh, person a few days before that he had been raising my name for the past several weeks in cabinet. What do you think he liked about you? I can tell you what he told me. He told me that I had moral courage, that moral courage is a very rare thing and politics needed it. And he wanted me to stay involved in politics but you, because of that. But you always, I mean, no, I won't say always, but you, you had clearly wanted to be elected. And the Senate obviously is not an elected position, it's an appointment. Mm -hmm. Was there any part of you that said, no, I want to run one more time, I want another shot no. at it? No, that didn't happen at all because we were all aware at the time that Mr. Trudeau was leaving. It was crystal clear to all of us. Hmm. And, um, and he was gone, you remember? He, he resigned in, in, in February, this is 1984, and the leadership convention, the new leadership convention was in June. Mm -hmm. So he called me to the Senate in January, just a little while before he announced that he would be resigning in June. And in fact, we have a picture of you signing into the Senate of Canada with the then Speaker Maurice Riel. Oh, yes. What do you remember about, about that moment where you are putting pen to paper and it's all official. A little girl well, from Barbados I, is in the Senate of Canada. Yes. I remember that moment very, very uh, clearly because he was a Montreal, a senator from Montreal. And that very day, lots of, of supporters of Mr. Trudeau also showed up. Like, for example, Jean Marchand. You remember it was Pelletier, Trudeau, and Marchand. The three who, wise men. The three wise men who, who went into politics together. Mm -hmm. And Jean Marchand was there actually that day and so that day is very vivid in my memory because that is really my first day as a senator your first day as a senator and you were a liberal senator at the time yes but but at a certain point you became disaffected with the liberal party and switched to the conservatives and sat with them in the p in the conservative caucus very brief. it was brief <laughs> and now you're an independent yes well I've been, i have been an, an independent all along i've just learned to understand it a lot better. You have been independent all along. Yes. But now you are sort of officially an independent, right? I think I was officially one all the time. <laughs> you were. I think Mr. Trudeau thought so too. Okay, so what, what, um, what was it about you it, and the Senate way of doing business that happened, clearly didn't mix? No, what happened is that it was a bad time. It was, there was a period when I was quite badly persecuted 
and I found it unbearable. Persecuted how? Be well, you're not allowed, they don't allow you to sit on committees, you don't get trips, all kinds of ways, thousands of ways uh, that they have of, of hurting you. Why do you think they did that? Because sometimes groups of women do these kinds of things just because they do it. Are you saying women senators did it this was, to you? It was the women who were doing it. And uh, I want you to know, though, there's been a lot of recovery from that. And there were some of those people who changed their minds about it and made up, made amends to me. So it was something that I could, that I, that I could put behind me, finally. But I do know it reached such a point that I did not want to be a member of the Liberal Caucus anymore. Well, you know, for, for most of its history, the Senate has been populated with old white guys, right? That was the <laughs> fact. And you're not an old white guy. No. Uh, this no. just in. No, no, you can say I'm an old brown skin. I woman. would, I would, I would not say that either. <laughs> I don't think you're that old, frankly. <laughs> okay. It, was that some of the problem here? Is that you just sort of didn't fit the mold of what they thought a no, senator should it, look like? No, it was not that. It was, it was a female thing. It, it was. I wouldn't want to, I could tell you much more of the details. We could do that in private, but I wouldn't do that in public. But I was very deeply hurt in that, in that time. But because I have a high degree of forbearance and a fair amount of endurance, I just stuck to my, uh, to my guns and I just stayed on my path. Well, let me pick up on that expression you just used. You said, I'm not an old white guy, I'm a, I'm a I think your words were old brown skinned woman. Well, I say that because in the Caribbean, British Caribbean, I was used to be described as a brown skinned girl. Okay. You're the first black female senator anywhere in North America. Mm -hmm. You were the first black person ever appointed to the Canadian Senate. Mm -hmm. And you have said before that you don't view your senatorship through the color of your skin. Why not? I don't not? remember when I said that because I do not. I, I, view, I view the world, you know, through other, my own eyes. But remember, my eyes are very well uh, trained and guided by years of reading. I'm a reader. You know, when I was eight years old, now I learn, you learn to read, to, write, to, uh, to read and write when you're about six. Mm. But I tell you, I have many, many memories of being up at five o'clock in the morning on Saturday mornings and reading away. And I remember when I came to, I, I remember reading, say I was about 10, because I could read quite well at that stage. And I was reading John Buchan's books. Now John Buchan had been a prime, uh, a governor general of Canada. Mm. So when I came to Canada at age 13, and I was put into school immediately at a school called Thomas Darcy McGee, the first two days I was there, I inquired as to who Thomas Darcy McGee was and nobody knew. Mm. And I couldn't understand that. And then at one point in, in literature, I raised the, uh, the the, the sense of, of the existence of John Buchan, who had been a governor general and a novelist, he wrote the book 39 Steps. And none of them had ever heard of him, and I couldn't mm. understand that again. Here's a Canadian governor general. And, uh, and I guess I haven't changed much because I am still reading. As a matter of fact, I just, right now, I have, I'm in the, about to make the fifth of a series of five speeches that I made all on Confederation. I'll send you copies. I've done four. And what happened to me, I, I started to write on this important matter, John and McDonald, and so on. And, uh, you know, it grew. First I had 2,000 words, then I had 4,000, then I had 6,000, then I had 8,000, and all of a sudden it was up to 12,000 words. I mean, that's, a, that's an essay, <laughs> a, a thesis. And then um, I said, oh, it's well, I'll... so I divided it into these five speeches, and I've given four in the Senate. I have the fifth to do, hopefully, in the next two weeks. Amen to that. I'm into it. I want to ask you but about... But I'm a reader. Always yes. have been. Yes. You know. I want to ask you about um, what has become, I think, fairly recently, uh, a controversy that has sort of burst into the open on Parliament Hill, and I want to get your take on it. Oh, yes. You know that uh, the new Democrat MP, Aaron Weir, has been expelled from caucus. There are allegations of, uh, you know, harassment there. Uh, but she's going really to harass it. The, well, the allegation I, I is... I was going to say, then there's another NDP MP okay, who's, maybe we'll get mixed who's, up, but yeah, who's also a yeah, female from Quebec, who's also um, under investigation uh, for similar allegations. Justin Trudeau lost a cabinet minister because of these allegations. There were two liberal backbench... He was a very nice fellow. I think can't hear you're talking about. Oh, no, there you're talking, another, the, the you're talking about uh, two MPs. Right. 
Um, who Pachima, were, I think yeah, his name Massimo was. Pacetti. Massimo. Yes. Massimo Pacetti, that's who, it. Who, again, were asked to leave the Liberal caucus because of this issue. There's a former conservative senator uh, who resigned rather than go through the process of being booted out. Mm -hmm. The conservatives had a former MP, former Ontario PC party president, who's also um, tossed out over these issues. Canadians may wonder whether or not Parliament Hill is just rife with sexual misconduct. What's your view? Well, if it is, I, I've not seen it. And uh, maybe it's, I'm too old for anybody to try to sexually harass me. I do not know. But there is no area of law which is more troubled ever than the business of sexual assault. Now, remember, uh, the original ch uh, crime used to be rape. And rape was a very serious offense, and um, it used to carry capital punishment. Hmm. So a charge of rape was an extremely serious matter. Now, somewhere, I think, is in the late 70s to the 80s, they do away with the term rape, and they bring in sexual assault. And if I can quote a particular judge uh, uh, who once said uh, something to the effect, the thing about sexual assault is that a person, a man can be charged with sexual assault and there was no assault and there was no sex. Whereas in the, in the, in the days of rape, I don't believe for a moment that the hill is rife with, with sexual assault. I don't believe that for a moment. How about sexual harassment? I am not convinced that that is the case either. Because there is, I mean, let's, let's be blunt about well, I'm this. Not, there... I'm not encountering it. I understand, but there are, there are sort of powerful older men who on a regular basis interact with younger, less powerful women. And those are oftentimes conditions under which this kind of thing happens. Well, the, the, the opposite happens too, because uh, you can find some of those women can be very active in their pursuit of their interests in, in, in one of those men. So, and I've, no, and I've known of, of cases like that, but older ones. Like Let me follow up on this angle here, Senator yes. Coles, because I find this uh, most fascinating about you. You're one of the people, uh, I'll say this, you're, you're, you're a kind of a rare female politician who often sides with men, who, who looked out for single fathers oh. and, and their responsibilities and rights to their children in the case of divorce. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I guess because my mother raised me to be a fair-minded human being. And uh, I'll tell you a little story. One time, and I remember this, I, my mother's been dead many years now, but there were some young people working on our property. I grew up on a small island, but on a lot of land. And they were back at the property, and they were working, weeding, and doing things on, on our land. And my mother called me up, and it was not long after Easter. And for Easter, I'd have this big box of chocolates. And I remember it clearly. And my mother called me, the, I had a nickname in those days, Peter, my brother, who gave me the name Peter, died as a child. And uh, she called me, she said, Pete, I want you to do me a favor. I said, oh, yes, mommy, yes, mommy. She said, you know that box of chocolates that you have? I want you to go and get that box of chocolates and bring it here. And then I want you to call each one of those people down there by name and offer them a chocolate. I said, oh, yes, mommy, yes, mommy. I remember this that yesterday. So I ran off and I came back with my chocolates. And then I did everything she told me. I stood there and I called them up one by one. I said, would you like a chocolate? I would like to give you a chocolate. And what really stays with me is what my mother said to me. She said to me, Peter, they have very little, those people. She said, you have to grow up and to work hard to make their lives better. So when I talk about my cousin, Billy, who was a foreign minister until recently, mm -hmm. and myself, it is no wonder, no surprise, that we have this attitude to public service because our parents taught us that, that we had a duty to make other people's lives better. Understood. It is. I want to put up now, if we can, control room, a picture of the man to whom you have been married for 32 years. Ooh. Here's your husband, Rolf Calhoun. Oh, my goodness. And there, now, who's that dog? That's our dog. We lost, we had to put her down. She a died a few years. years ago, eh? Yeah, we, oh, man, nearly killed me. That was Lady? That, no, Lady's the one we have now. Oh, Lady but you have. But this is Tara. That was she Tara. Was, and she was a champion dog. Now, Senator Linda Frum, 
one of your colleagues in the Senate, mm -hmm. says that because you didn't have any kids of your own... Oh, I have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but she says you sought fulfillment by being a mother to all. Is she oh. on to something there with that? Well, um, I am a source of support for many people. And many people come to talk to me when they are trying to sort out problems. And I pride myself that I keep all that information private, but I will, I, if anyone seeks that kind of personal assistance, I will certainly give it. And I try to do it with wisdom and uh, with full respect for the, for the uh, issues. I remember years ago, he's long dead now, but he was an older senator, and he was one of the last of the different Baker appointments. And he's been dead a, lot of, a long time. And he approached me one day, and he said to me, Senator Cools, I wonder if I could have a few minutes of your time. He said, I'm having some family problems that I would like to discuss with you. One child had entered into a love, a love affair with somebody else that the family members weren't too sure about, and for whatever reasons. And um, I said to him, Senator, you make sure in your dealings that you're talking about your child here and your child's potential for hurt. You, you sit down with your wife and you tell her that they, you and she must absolutely never say anything bad, anything negative about this love affair. Because if you do, you will certainly lose the affection of that child. Mm -hmm. And he came back a couple of times and then one day he came back and said everything had was resolved and everybody was happy. Everybody was happy and everybody was absolutely loving this particular person that they wouldn't have even looked at before. We've got a couple of minutes left here and I, I think everybody is kind of expecting me, expecting me to ask the following question, okay. which is Trudeau the father put you in the Senate and Trudeau the son is now the Prime Minister. Yes. And that gives you, in some respects, a unique position from which to compare and contrast the strengths of both men. What would you say? I would say one thing first. I say that Mr. Uh, Candace from C to C, but I'm from Trudeau to Trudeau. <laughs> I think that uh, the, the two Trudeaus are quite different. The two men are quite different, and that is okay uh, to me. But he has to, he has to, uh, to cast this his own heritage, his own achievements. It's up to him. And, up, um, up to Justin. Up to Justin. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very different people, but so, so are most uh, parents and children. Mm -hmm. I wish him very well, and I would like to see him do well because I had a very good relationship with his father. But he, he will be the master of his own fate. Have you ever talked to the current prime minister about your times with his dad? No, never discussed it, but I do remember Mr. Trudeau's funeral very well, very, very well. It was very hard. I, I, I could hardly get through it. I actually did break down. It was a, a huge thing. And so I do remember uh, his eulogy and, and his homily. I do remember that very, very well. I also remember when Mr. Castro arrived and the crowds went up in cheers <laughs> and, and Mr. Castro was rushing to, to, to hold, to, to touch the, uh, the coffin. And uh, so I do remember the whole funeral and the, and the terrible sadness because that, his passage was a, a kind of a, 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 had an effect on an entire generation because many, many Canadians remember, you know, when he announced back in 68, the just society, what a beautiful, mm. what a beautiful sig uh, signal, symbol as well. Well, he named, just, his, he named his firstborn son after that word. Precisely. Yeah. So, no, they're different men and uh, they're different people and, and that is correct and that is proper. And I wish him very well because I will no longer be a member in a very few weeks. Well, that's where I want to end up here because your term is about to expire when you turn 75 in August. 12th. August 12th. The day I was born. What are you going to do? Oh, I have lots of things to do. Like what? Like, for example, I haven't been able to practice my piano very much in the last few years. I was so busy. Mm. So I want to get back to putting in an hour or two every day because I must recapture some of what I've lost. I also have a dog, so I always need time to, to work with my dog. Mm. 
In addition, in addition to that, I like to get to the gym every other morning and to, to spend a full hour at the gym. I did it this morning here. Hmm. And uh, so I would like to get back to those ordinary things that I've been cutting a little thin for the longest time because I've been a little bit busy. I also want to spend more time with my husband as well. That was my husband that you just saw. <laughs> Those sound like very reasonable things to do. I, I, I hope if so. you have a concert at some point, you'll invite us all here so we can see you perform as the oh, no, no, not that grand good. pianist that you will be. <laughs> no, no, I'm not that good. Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we not that, but I can invite you to my house. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you very much for spending so much time with us here tonight on TVO. It's not your first time here and hopefully won't be the last. So, Senator Ann Cools, we wish you well with whatever comes next for you. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.